Welcome to Channel 98. Joel Afredo is the videographer and I'm Norma Goodman and we are very privileged today to talk to a local author who is Sue Ellen McManus who has written a great book on the images of Greater Baldwinsville and it's a compilation of the uh, authentic pictures with short histories of Greater Baldwinsville. So I'm going to introduce Sue Ellen now to you, and uh, she's going to tell us why uh, she did this book. I'm sure it took a lot of time, and we greatly appreciate it. Those of us who have read it are just really uh, astounded at the amount of history that is in this area. Welcome, Sue. Norma, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about Greater Baldwinsville. It's one of my favorite subjects. We all know that. Um, the book itself took well, probably from the first idea until it actually came out. It was probably close to six years. It actually took me three years to pull it together. At first, it seemed like a fun idea. Talk about something you really love. And then it became, oh, dear, how are we going to get this thing done <laughs> on time? And the hardest part, I think, was deciding Baldwinsville's story is so rich. What part will you tell? So that brought it down to um, devising a, a plan. And uh, actually, I went at it by um, going into a chapter system to, to organize it. So once I got the chapters organized, I thought, well, now I'm, I'm all set. And then I had trouble within the chapters deciding what should really go, because there's just so much space. So I tried really hard to make sure that we had some of the great, familiar, traditional uh, images and pieces of information that you really need to understand the story. But then it was a great opportunity to talk about the little known or the unpublished, um, wonderful people and events uh, that, that could possibly fall, you know, between the cracks of history. And here was a chance to let everybody know, or at least, or at least my family and friends. <laughs> And those pieces of information. So I found that to be really a, a great motivation to move on. Well, thank you, Sue. Well, let's go right on to uh, all the chapters, and there are eight of them. And uh, let's start with uh, bricks and mortar, and you can explain why you chose these. And uh, some, some of these buildings are still standing. Many are still in use. And uh, so... So go to it and give us a reason for all these pictures. <laughs> Justify every picture, oh dear. Well, um, when you start with uh, the book, uh, y the first image is actually a water image of the Seneca River. And it shows the Seneca River, the Barge Canal, and the Baldwin Canal. And I really think that with anything you talk about in Baldwinsville, you really have to look to the river for the heart of it whether it's its history, its commerce, um, just getting uh, from where we live to uh, the, the grocery store, we have to cross the bridge. So the river is really important. It was important 200 years ago. It's important yet today. So we started with that picture. It's a great aerial picture, I think. And then um, I think the very first bricks and mortar. In bricks and mortar, when I uh, put this together, that was built environment. And um, this is such a great photo of 19th century Baldwinsville at its economic high, uh, high Victorian architecture. And actually, some of those buildings are still there, whether you realize it or not. Starting from the far left, we have the building that today is the Burnt Michaels Cleaners. And that was actually designed by Archimedes Russell, a very prominent New York State architect. And it was built to be a bank building. The second building in the middle there is the Connell store at the time of this photograph, and the photograph was about 1900. And that was a, a big general department store, and that is still standing today with the upper story removed. And uh, for many of us, it was known as Tickums, and today, of course, it's the Village Mall. The third building is a very high Victorian architecture piece, and it's the Howard Opera House. And Actually, that was a wonderful part of the community's cultural system. The third floor of that was a theater. The building burnt 
1914 and was replaced by the Grange Hall, which today houses Pizza Man. And most people don't realize the third floor of that building today still has a theater, a stage, and was set up to um, carry on the same function of the Opera House. I chose this photograph because it shows the Seneca Hotel and one of the Four Corners. This is what the Four Corners looked like where Keeley's is today. This was a marvelous building and it was the third Seneca Hotel. This one burnt down in 1936 and was never replaced with Victorian architecture. We're familiar with what we have today. And this is another of the Four Corners. This is the um, southwest corner and actually the buildings that you see here are there yet today. Uh, and just, just kind of change the signs, and you're going to see them right now. Today we have a new um, sports uh, memorabilia shop right there in the corner. The Corner Cakery was there for those of you who have that memory. And you can go right down both um, Syracuse Street, or Oswego Street actually right there, and uh, West Genesee Street. Following another devastating fire at the Four Corners, a piece of Victorian architecture was replaced with this Masonic temple. And of course, we've seen that building change hands now in the more recent years. And uh, its most recent use was Conroy's uh, antiques business, and it certainly lent itself to that. I love the policeman there in the middle of the intersection, hand directing the traffic. Today, of course, we have mega poles and high-tech lighting and walk do not walk signs and they're all missing from that photo and then there are certainly many many um, residential photos in, in the in the book and this is one of them that is still standing and of course this is on Oswego Street and was the home of Dr. Kendall and he's not only a prominent doctor and a member of the um, GAR but he's associated with that great story of bringing back to Baldwinsville a freed slave, a young man named Joseph Fugit. And the Fugit story became a big part of Baldwinsville's history. And young Mr. Fugit is in this photo. He's holding the reins of the horse out in front. So that was kind of fun doing bricks and mortar. The next chapter is commerce and industry. Of course, we have the river, and that's why we had all of that. But we have mills and boat builders and farms and foundries, and with the foundries, many innovations and patents among um, most of these endeavors. But one that caught my eye in the commerce section was the horse-drawn ice cream wagon uh, way before motorized Skippy ice cream wagons that used to come with his music and wake up our kids when they were napping. But I thought that was was so great. I'm going to have Sue show you the picture. And then, of course, uh, we'll talk about George Harris, who took a lot of these pictures. But Sue, talk about all of these pictures and commerce in Baldwinsville. It seemed to me that if we were going to start the book with pictures of all the great buildings and landmarks, we needed to go and talk about where we got the funding to make these things happen. And I've got to tell you, Norma, I share your affection for that great photograph of the ice cream vendor. It was taken about 1915, and the ice cream man is Ross Loveless, and he is peddling Conklin's ice cream, which was made in Syracuse. And I love the uh, similarities between the way it was marketed then and the way it's marketed today. Um, when you can't have everyone coming to the source of supply, you bring the supply to them. So, of course, instead of a motorized vehicle, we've got horse-drawn. Instead of recorded music coming out of the Skippy truck, if you look closely, you can see the bell hanging from the horse's uh, harness, the shaft of the wagon, actually. So when the horse moved along, the bell rang, and everybody knew the ice cream man was there. He also has a great little uh, coin receptacle hanging from his belt. Unfortunately, we do not know who the child is, but it's an endearing photo, and it shows that all technology has done for us is make it easier to get the Skippy Man around town. <laughs> I think um, the next photo that we were going to talk about really shows the overview of, of commercial Baldwinsville, industrial Baldwinsville. The view was taken uh, from the south side of the river, and what you're looking at is the area of Genesee Street going to the east from the Four Corners. And it is just jam-packed with mills, Morris Machine Works. You can see the railroad going across what today are empty bridge abutments, serving the industrial needs of downtown. It was a busy place. 
And, and I, this is another great photo for showing um, how busy we were. In that overview, the aerial view that we started with, we saw the Baldwin Canal, which ran along the north side of the river from approximately um, Mercer Park to uh, the town of Lysander Building. And here you see the Baldwin Canal and why it was so important. It was a raceway and a service uh, piece to get around the dam. And what you're looking at on the right-hand side of the picture is actually West, pardon me, East Genesee Street. And what you're looking at on the left-hand side of the picture is a whole series of industrial complexes that were built on a, the spit of land that extended between the canal and the river. In the very background center, you can see the spire of the Methodist Church. That helps give you maybe a, f a focus point. Uh, it was busy, busy, and as you can see, it was built cheek to jowl to take advantage of the water power. And as you said, we had foundries, we had mills. This is a great interior photograph from Morris Machine Works. And you can see, if you look closely, the relative size of the pump that was being produced here to the size of the workmen working on it. Morris Machine Works, of course, carried the community very uh, heavily from approximately 1864 until um, the company was sold out of the family in 1981. It was a long and wonderful relationship between uh, community and company. This is one of those little knowns. I love this one. <laughs> you can read the name on the building that says New Process Gear. I think few people realize that what we then in later years have called Chrysler New Process Gear, it actually began in Baldwinsville. And the uh, factory was located on what is today Paper Mill Island. It really was a very industrial site, Paper Mill Island, in its uh, more active years. And the company didn't start making gears. They actually started as a tannery, and they made leather canoes. And then they went into leather gears. Uh, and then, of course, they progressed from there. But it started in Baldwin's and It's kind of neat to know. Oh, tobacco. I love this. Um, we're going to talk about tobacco a little bit later when we talk about agriculture, but this is right in the village. This is East Genesee Street. The water that you're looking at is the Baldwin Canal. The buildings on the far right, that's Morris Machine Works, and most of us recall how that stretched right along. Well, essentially where Kinney Drugs is today, that whole block, and then um, they had uh, warehouses where the library is today. And what you're seeing is a whole parade of wagons loaded with tobacco being brought to the train station where they were going to be loaded on the train. The tobacco had already been pre-sold, and it was our biggest cash crop, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And if we're going to talk about mills, we absolutely have to talk about Mercer Mill because it's the granddaddy of the mall as far as visibility goes. It wasn't the greatest producer, but it was highly visible right there next to the river, and actually then it ended up between the river and the Barge Canal when that came through. And, of course, it was the last of our operating mills. And today it's still in evident in a new life as the Red Mill Inn. And um, got to talk about the mill. <laughs> And, and you made reference to this gentleman. This is George Washington Harris, and he indeed took many, many photos, uh, many of which are in this book. He w actually, though, while he was a talented photographer, uh, he was also a naturalist. He was also a bit of an artist. I understand he had a fantastic baritone voice. Um, Bill Kriego told me that. He remembers him. Uh, Bill was a, a youngster when George Washington Harris came to Baldwinsville as a tobacco specialist, he was sent by the Department of the Interior to help Baldwinsville farmers uh, refine their uh, production methods. So we are happy to have him uh, as the photographer of uh, so many of our uh, local events, and, and but we've got a lot of nature scenes from him too, so we'll be seeing more of him. And the next chapter, of course, is Civic and Danvers. And Sue Allen is going to talk about the Red Cross girls and the ladies selling popcorn. They're still doing that today. And for Chautauqua Week, Chautauqua Week, which I never heard of. Also, the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, 
uh, who raised money for the Civil War monument that's now in Riverside Cemetery, and many of the pictures of the churches that are so prominent throughout Greater Baldwinsville, and some are still in function today. Well, Sue, this sounds like another interesting chapter. Well, Norma, I have to admit that this chapter is the one that's closest to my heart. This chapter is filled with people, and many of these people we know. Schools are named after them. Uh, scout troops are named after them. But there are people in here who I think haven't been celebrated the way they should be, and their stories are important. And I, I hope that if, if you only have five minutes and you're in the library and you pick up this book, that you'll open it up and, and learn about these people. These people did what you're doing today. They made Baldwinsville a special place. But you made reference to the Chautauqua story, and I, I love that story. And if it weren't, this photo was taken by George Washington Harris, whom we just met. And it shows these great young girls in 1918. And they are wearing a red cross regalia, but actually they set up their little um, fundraising booth for the Red Cross at Baldwinsville's annual Chautauqua, and I'll tell you about that. They sold popcorn and made $35.50, and of course the Red Cross effort was really highly recognized and well supported because we were just coming out of World War I. But Baldwinsville participated. We all know about the Chautauqua movement that um, originated down in the south west corner of New York State at the beautiful Lake Chautauqua. And while Chautauqua was so popular because it was an adult education opportunity, um, people were educated in the sciences, they were entertained with the arts, they broadened their horizons, and those who could afford to went to Chautauqua for a day, a week, or a month. But so many people couldn't go and still wanted the experience, and America being the um, capitalistic society that we are, we figured out ways to bring Chautauqua to the people, just as we can bring ice cream to the people who can't get to the store. And so there were traveling Chautauquas, and they would go make circuits around the country, and Red Path was one of the few branded Chautauquas. And Red Path Chautauqua came to Syracuse in Dinondaga County, and it came by train, there'd be a train load, and it would have a preset program each year. They would sign up. Um, people who were authorities on science, people who could speak well on literature, people who could sing well, people who could uh, give art lessons, and they would take this group from town to town to town. And Baldwinsville enjoyed this opportunity from the uh, mid-1915 era until 1921 was the last year Chautauqua actually came to Baldwinsville. And the setup was uh, on the... Uh, Baldwinsville Academy grounds, which of course then later was known as the Elizabeth Street School, and then uh, that has changed over to Word of Life Church, but that's where the event took place. And it ran for a full week here with programs for youngsters, teens, and adults. And um, th there's a whole lot to that story. I love it. They published magazines. They published books. Just a great story. We're going to talk about it at the museum sometime. Oh, and this, you made reference to this. This was a a great local effort that is evident yet today. The GAR in 1887 raised enough money to put up a monument honoring not only the um, veterans of the Civil War, but they had embossed on that monument the names of every single Bevillian who participated in any uh, war up until that time. And that monument was proudly standing in front of the Methodist Church for many, many years, actually until about 1950, and it had to be removed to make room to widen the roadway, and we can all see why. And today it re uh, resides in Riverview Cemetery and is the focal point of a Veterans Memorial Park. And while it's out of the immediate public eye, it certainly sits in a very respectful and dignified setting, and it does get uh, recognition throughout the year. Uh, a wonderful tribute to Baldwinsville, recognizing Baldwinsville. This is a cool picture. <laughs> this is the Reverend Beecham, uh, Reverend William Martin Beecham, who served in Baldwinsville for over 40 years, served uh, well and he had a very loyal and uh, dedicated following. He was extremely articulate, 
extremely interested in people and uh, human nature. But it went beyond that. He had, uh, maybe he honored his religious calling by paying so much attention to people. Uh, he was very interested in the Native Americans and is still recognized today as an authority on Native American culture and traditions. And he recognized in the 1860s and 70s that our fellow Americans did not have any written record of their traditions and history. It was all oral history, and he worked hard to document everything that he could. And today, the State Education Department in Albany still reprints the articles he wrote because they have nothing more authoritative. But here he is in Grace Episcopal Church's Sanctuary, which was the first church in America to be illuminated by electricity. And you can see the bare bulb hanging over his head there. In 1886, an extension cord was run from Morris Machine Works would have just put in hydropower to generate electricity, to the church, was, which was on Elizabeth Street, almost in the backyard of Morris Machine Works. But you will notice, despite the electric bulbs, if you look on the far wall, you will see a kerosene lamp sitting there in its wall bracket, just in case. <laughs> and churches were and are a big part of Baldwinsville yesterday and today. And this, this is a great shot of the Presbyterian Church and it's one of several. Actually, there were three churches in Baldwinsville that were designed by Horatio Nelson White, another prominent central New York architect. He did the uh, Hall of Languages at SU that sits up there and just looks over the whole hilltop. Um, Presbyterian Church was built in 1865. And again, this shows Baldwinsville's um, awareness of what's going on in the world, very cosmopolitan, very aware of who's the, the architect of the day, and he had the money to do it. Not all of the churches at that time were um, high style, uh, and some of them came along a little later. Actually, the Presbyterian Church, I do believe, was the first to take that step forward from frame building to uh, stone building. At, at this time, uh, St. Mary's Congregation had been active for many, many years, and they were in this frame building on Tappan Street at the corner of McCary Street. And in 1939, when uh, that congregation built their handsome stone edifice on Syracuse Street, this building then was reclaimed for other uses. And over the years, it's been a sanitarium, it's been a health center, and today it's an apartment house. But one of many Baldwinsville churches and just part of our great civic face. And now we're on Chapter 4. And because of the river and the canals and trolleys and trains, we had bridges and horse carriers and... Then we went to roadways and throughway and 690, all roads leading to Baldwinsville. In, we have interesting photos here. But first I want to ask Sue, uh, I, I would have uh, called this transportation, but you're calling it locomotion. Could you please explain that, Sue? Leave it to you to ask the hard ones, Norma. Um, it just seemed to me that transportation was kind of a pretty cut and dried thing. And um, I'm not real keen on trains and trolleys and big irony things. <laughs> and so I thought, well, if I were going to flip through this book, and it's a flip through book, you can open it any place, I, I hope, um, transportation would probably be the last place I would go. Locomotion, locomotion would make me wonder, what in the world are they talking about? And that's why I went for that word. <laughs> Oh, and you're so right. I mean, we talk about trains and trolleys and all of that, and here's just a smattering, and they're all in the book, but here's a smattering. Um, this is a lock on the uh, Baldwin Canal, and this is the lift lock about 1890. Baldwin Canal was so important to Baldwinsville, and I know we keep coming back to it, but, you know, we had that Baldwin Canal in 1890. That was, like, 15 years before the Erie Canal even opened. I mean, talk about being forward thinking. It was actually 16 years. So here we go, and this was on Lock Street. And, and guess where Lock Street got its name? When the Baldwin Canal was eventually filled in, it became a street, and the name of the street is, you can fill in the blank. Okay, this is a cool picture. I like this one. It's a really um, great photograph, sharp-wise. Um, and this is a very small, wonderful local railroad. It opened in 1886. It was the Syracuse-Baldwinsville Railroad. It was privately owned. It's 
main job was to get railroad service into the center of the village. And it did a good job for about four or five years, and then it went bankrupt, and it was really a sad, sad story. And uh, get the book and read all about it. <laughs> but the railroad did come to Baldwinsville in 1848, and the community was well served by railroad right up through the 1950s. And this was the passenger station on East Genesee Street about where uh, the Northern Collision Company is today. And as you can see, we've got the water tower there to uh, supply the, the steam trains, you know, to, to fill up the, the tank. And there's a lot of cool detail there, fun pictures, and a lot of information about railroad. Now, this is definitely not a big iron thing when it comes to locomotion. This is a houseboat on the river down near Dead Creek. Um, and we, we even have the names of the fellows who sit there and uh, are enjoying the houseboat. The photo, again, was taken by George Washington Harris. I mean, I know he was a tobacco expert, but what an eye this man had for local events and um, things that were really important and would have been lost. Do you like the rain gutter there? I mean, all the comforts of home on the front porch of the houseboat, do we? This is a great image of industrial Baldwinsville. What appears to be mud in the foreground is actually the Baldwin Canal. And you are standing with your back to today's Kinney's Drug Store, OK? And there's just a little spit of land between you and the canal. Today, where we've got the parking lot that runs Oh, behind the Baldwinsville Diner and goes across uh, to the post office, essentially. That was the bed of the Baldwin Canal. And what you're seeing in the background is part of our milling industry in the village. And what you're seeing in between are two boats, packet boats, that were built in Baldwinsville by the Brown Boat Works. So there's an awful lot of story in this picture. Okay, this is transportation, isn't it? This is an early automobile. This is a great photo of Carl Lager, who was uh, at Mor Morris Machine Works. And his story is an interesting story in its own right, and that's also in the book. But in 1903, he was reputed to have brought the first automobile into Baldwinsville, and we're looking at it here. It's a locomobile. That's its name. Pretty good for locomotion, huh? <laughs> and this uh, vehicle was uh, supposed to be able to go 30 miles an hour, I think you'd be standing on your head, hanging on with your fingertips. It could seat four comfortably, four very skinny people, I would think, because Carl seems to be filling it quite adequately, and was supposed to be a good hill climber. But he certainly made local history by having the first automobile in the village. Automobile pictures are great, aren't they? Because it gives you a sense of time and place and fashion and technology. Because, you know, technology now is changing. With Carl, you definitely saw it was a horseless carriage. In this photograph of Gertrude Kratzer, taken about 1916, doesn't really look like a horseless carriage any lo longer. It's what we consider an automobile. Gertrude Kratzer was the first woman to drive an automobile in the village. And the automobile shown here belonged to her father-in-law, Rumont Kratzer, who owned the Seneca Mill. Uh, Mr. Kratzer was very uh, involved both in industry and in civic in endeavors. You'll see him in the Board of Education, involved with the Water Department, very interested in making Baldwinsville uh, a better place. Gertrude said, she told me about this photograph, she passed away in 1990 at the age of 96. She said she was in great demand for driving at funerals, <laughs> and she enjoyed it thoroughly. She was also, and, and many people I think will remember Gertrude, she was the town of Lysander clerk for many, many years, and she was a natural historian. She was interested in people and events. She kept many records and scrapbooks, and her mind was one giant trap understanding relationships. She was fantastic. So Gertrude Kratzer is an important person to note in this book. And now we're going to chapter five. 
and that's beyond the village. The, while the village was uh, very good and uh, very active, we all had all of these farmers and growing things, and the Indian Springs Flower Farm was one probably of the most important um, uh, growing areas in here, which the McCary's legacy continues with the G a June Peony Craft Show, which I hope you all attend. Also, there was tobacco farming, known as the cash crop for farmers. And then there's the Marinus Willet House, the names in Radisson uh, that are very familiar to people, but uh, with a person who had very close ties to New York City. And Sue, you can explain all of these. Well, it's a tall order to explain them, but I, I think it's a, it's great, as you said, Norma, to look outside the village because today we call it Greater Baldwinsville. It always was. Neither the outlying area nor the village could exist as well and as competently as they all have without each other. I mean, it was just, it's a marvelous uh, cooperative effort. And uh, you have to look at everything, I think, together to understand what makes Baldwinsville the special place it is. And we mean greater Baldwinsville. And of course, Indian Spring Farms is one of my favorite agricultural topics. Rural Baldwinsville was essentially agriculture. And actually today, agriculture is still New York State's largest single industry here in 2011. How'd that happen, 2011? But anyhow, right here we've got a, a picture of Art Chapin, who was the superintendent at Indian Spring Farms. The farm was located on Route 370 going out towards Plainville. And it specialized in, in peonies, but it also had a uh, great reputation for iris and narcissus and then many other assorted um, shrubs, lilacs, um, glads all part of the, of the farm's uh, product line. Over 400 acres was devoted to this endeavor. And the Indian Spring Farm commercially was short-lived. It essentially got off the ground and, and running about 1920 and ran until only 1933. But it had a, a nation, nationwide impact. Its materials were sought from all over the world. They advertised in national magazines. And the one thing about peonies is they're long-lived. They can happily live for over 100 years in the same spot. So while the farm closed in 1933, today we're still able to um, enjoy peonies from the farm. And as you referenced, the museum had a rescue project with farm peonies. And today we grow them here on, on our grounds. But our Chapin was a superintendent for many years. And after the farm closed, he opened a small um, peony farm, if you will, of his own out in the hamlet of Lysander. And it became uh, the Lysander, pardon me, I'm drawing a blank on the name of his business. But if you read the book, you'll find out all about it. <laughs> the uh, other uh, specialized product that you uh, referenced was tobacco. And tobacco was the most important cash crop for Baldwinsville. And Baldwinsville was the tobacco growing capital of Onondaga County for a century. We began growing tobacco here in 1850 and our last commercial crop was in 1952. And this was such an important thing because it was paid for in cash. And Baldwinsville's soil lent itself to tobacco production. The reason we stopped producing tobacco wasn't because of weather. It was because uh, tobacco is very hand labor intensive in its demands, and um, eventually we couldn't keep up with that. The first photo that you showed shows the guys out in the field setting out the young plants. And then the second photo shows uh, Mr. Fuller, I believe it is, hoeing tobacco. And as we move along, there'll be a, th a third uh, photo showing the very mature tobacco leaves that have just been harvested. And they were so fragile, they were hung on special wagons, on racks. And it was called a rack wagon. And here you see the crop being taken out of the field. And then there were many, many more steps after that and the steps in between. And again, we address those in the book. But interestingly enough, I think to know those three photos that you just uh, shared with us were all taken by George Washington Harris. And those were taken as part of his documentation of um, trying to 
come up with a better tobacco growing system for Baldwinsville. Interestingly enough, he discovered that the soils on the different farms that were involved in tobacco production here were so varied that he couldn't come up with a standard plan, which is what they had done in so many other parts of, of the country. And each farm in Baldwinsville had its own custom plan. And they produced um, cigar wrapper leaves and, and with great success between 1884 and 1890. Each year, the Baldwinsville tobacco farmers brought in $1 million, and that was spent here. It explains our big, beautiful houses in downtown. Oh, and this is definitely beyond the village, but so noteworthy. This is the Marinus Willett House. And it was located on today's River Road, but actually very close to the Seneca River. When it was built in 1796, you could only access this property from the river. And what we're looking at is the front of the house, and it faced the river. Again, Seneca River, the heart of Baldwinsville, the transportation highway. Marinus Willett was an interesting man. He had been um, the mayor of New York City. And before him, his great-grandfather had been mayor of New York City. In 1665, the Willets were involved. What's that? 100 years, more, more than 100, 111 years before um, the independence in 1776. So the Willett family had a very well-established, long history with this country and with New York State. And isn't it interesting that just 20 years after the Declaration of Independence, we have this New York City mayor coming here to central New York and building this marvelous home. And of course, many notables visited this home over the years, and actually it stood for um, not quite 200 years, almost 200 years, and um, met with a sad fate that we won't talk about. <laughs> Chapter 6, Summer on the Seneca. Don't we all wish they were here now? But of course, the boats were all built in Beeville, and they were used to take trips to the amusement, amusement and picnic facilities at Liverpool. The Long Branch Park, we remember, had a roller coaster, and there were other uh, events on the lake. And so, Sue, people had fun in the, sem in the early years of the Seneca River, and Baldwinsville was part of it. So let's talk about those boats and what they did. We were in a perfect position to enjoy summer on the Seneca. And um, this was one of the, the fun fun chapters. And this, this chapter was really difficult. The museum's collection of photographs is so rich in boating photos and uh, recreational photos. Um, it was really difficult to make decisions. But certainly, as you referenced, Norma, uh, we had many, many boats that were built in Baldwinsville, and we had the Brown Boat Works. And with the Brown Boat Works, we had uh, quite a collection of packet boats that were constructed, and they were named after prominent citizens, too, which is kind of fun. You know, like this is the Kirk, we had the McMullen. Um, they were about three, they could, they were about 90 feet long. They varied a bit. We're going to see all sorts of boats going up and down the river um, because summer on the Seneca was a special time, and we were in a very special place, which is why we had boat building, too. Uh, and actually, the photo that we're seeing right now was built in Baldwinsville by the Brown Boat Works, and it was one of many packet boats that they built. The boats were about 90, passenger packets, the boats were about 90 feet long. They made a big deal about the great upholstery that was on the plush seats inside the, the cabin. And they could hold about 300 people. And in the summer, in good weather, these boats would go from Baldwinsville to Long Branch at Liverpool with lots of happy people on great excursions. Everything from company picnics to family events to church picnics to just regularly scheduled trips out to Long Branch that anyone could, could sign up for. And here you see a happy group heading out for Long Branch. Again, I think this is on the Kirk. And uh, notice the great big black umbrellas that are being used as, as parasols, essentially, to protect people from the sun. But how wonderful the women in all those great big dresses and the men in the vests and the big hats and all of this. And this is going to be fun. Uh, more, more power to them, right? That was really a great, great. And we've got lots of different kinds of vessels, too, that are plying the uh, river. This is a steam-powered launch. 
with uh, Newton Bartlett, the bookkeeper for the J.C. Miller Knitting Mill. And he's at the helm of the family launch, which was named Gladys, after their daughter, Gladys Miller. And actually, we have other pictures in the museum collection of Mr. Bartlett uh, manning um, the sleigh, horse-drawn sleigh going. It's a beautiful picture. I think it's in the book, too. Uh, going up the snow-covered um, North Street to the Miller home up on West Oneida Street. So, of course, we had these great little launches with, the, do you like the canopy over the, yes, yeah, cute, huh? Okay. And then as time went on and vessels became more refined and sleek and uh, speed was becoming more attractive to people, we had things such as this this great boat that was built by Carl Lager, and he's seen here in the, in the vessel. And the Guts in the engine for this were built at Morris Machine Works. So this was a, a very speedy boat. It's the Vagabondia, and it was a very popular boat up at the Thousand Islands where it won a whole lot of uh, contests. And that boat today, wouldn't you love to have that boat? Yeah, mm -hmm. This is a, a great picture. Families having fun, and it's the Wells family reunion. And this photo is at Long Branch. So the buildings that you see in ba the back are part of the general picnic facilities that were provided for the great crowds that visited Long Branch. And we were just fortunate enough to have the identification of everyone in that photograph. And, and they're all identified in the book. And when you go through the, the names, you're going to see Baldwinsville's movers and shakers in that one giant group picture because it's family and friends. It's really a, a great document. And then we go from these great big elaborate family reunions to a backyard picnic in 1920. And the scene is the Mercer home backyard on uh, West Genesee Street. Great story about that house too and I think we cover that in the book as well. But all these kids are together and the picnic is a, a circus. And you can see that they're dressed in, in circus garb, and they are all identified, and they include uh, folks such as B Bud Mercer and Nellie Fulmer and uh, Bob Shea, you know, wonderful parts of Baldwinsville's families and stories. So kids got to have fun. You can't talk about summer on the Seneca without talking about fishing. I mean, from the get-go, right? Uh, we know that our earliest peoples were here. Our Native Americans were here hundreds and hundreds of years ago because of the fishing. They were attracted here uh, by the eel fishing and, and other fish that were available. And fishing continues yet today. We've got our carp tournament every May. It's a very big event. So in between, people are fishing too. That's Jack Monroe. And you can see the dam in the background. He's got a string of bass. And, uh, you know, you take a minute and you can figure out where he's standing. It's about 1900. Chapter 7, Neighboring Hamlets, of which there's still some standing. But the most well-known, of course, was the Whig Hill House in Plainville, where it is said that Henry Clay visited James Voorhees and planned the Whig Party, which was formed in the 1850s. Then, of course, we have uh, all the, uh, some of the other hamlets, West Phoenix, Lamson, Lysander, Jacksonville, which in 1793 is known to have the first permanent resident of this area. Also, there is Jack's Reef, Little Utica, Memphis, known then as Canton, and Warners, and they, uh, many of them are still around, but we're going to have Sue talk about some of that. I'm sure she's well versed in everything. Well, how's that for a vote of confidence, Norma? <laughs> I enjoyed hearing you talk about the the hamlets uh, and, and list them. And you know that's just a bit of a bit of the list. It's amazing how many places have been and have faded. And there were many of those places that we couldn't document because we didn't have a photograph. You know, so many of those were pre instamatic. And, and so that was kind of sad, but I, I think that it's great, you know, to list as many as we can and to talk about where they are. And I think actually in in the book we've got a map that shows where they they were. So that's cool. This is, this is a fantastic structure in our outlying hamlets. This is Wig Hill, a marvelous residence built in 1833, Greek Revival style, very high style. 
Uh, obviously, the brick and the stone had to be imported. We weren't quarrying beautiful things like that at that time here. It was built by James Voorhees, who was a very interesting entrepreneur. He bought acres and acres of property out in the um, outlying area in Lysander. And he was called the Tall Pine of Lysander because what he did was harvest marvelous virgin forests and these wonderful long, long, long trees were put on, they were rafted together, sent down the Seneca River, and eventually ended up in New York City where they were used in boat building and many of those became masts for the tall ships. And that's why it was called the Tall Pine of Lysander. Um, forestry and, and uh, Utilizing the forests and the natural material there um, was a big industry in Baldwinsville until, of course, we depleted the forest. But Voorhees was uh, someone who really made a uh, great fortune doing that. And so while he was certainly making money and he was very involved in New York City, as we can imagine, he was also involved in politics and other civic endeavors. And indeed, Henry Clay was a frequent visitor to this home in Lysander. And... Um, they, between the two of them, Voorhees and Clay, came up with the idea of the Whig Party, and all of there's a big story after that, as we well know. So that's a great local landmark, and today it's still used as a residence and beautifully maintained. And then we move out into some of the other outlying areas, and here we've got a great picture of the hamlet of Lysander, which was a very active community, and many references you'll find it called um, the Village of Lysander. And right there we've got a general store in Lysander, and it's Gillette's store. And Gillette was a, a very uh, well-established name out there at the turn of the century. And here we've got Gillette's uh, general store. But if you look, you can see the upstairs is being used as a residence because there's a baby sitting in the window. Now, will the baby fall? That's not in the book. We don't know. <laughs> and, and we're going into another uh, hamlet out in the town of Lysander. And here we've got Lamson. This is Scriber's store. Each of these communities was indeed a complete community. It had tra transportation. It had uh, merchants. It had um, a great, uh, most of them had not one church, but several churches. They had community schools. These were vibrant areas all around the village of Baldwinsville because, of course, we didn't have the ready transportation that we have today. This was a fascinating building. This picture was taken about um, 1910. That building housed a ballroom on the third floor, meeting rooms, uh, accommodations for travelers, as well as a general store. And Mr. Scriber was uh, the county sheriff, too, for quite a while. He was a very well-known man. We're moving out now to Jack's Reef. And I I, I like this picture because we I think we typically see the covered bridge at Jack's Reef and it's great and it's romantic and everybody goes, oh, we missed the bridge and of course couldn't maintain it and all of those technical difficulties. But here you see people. Jack's Reef was a very popular picnic place and there was a big um, docking area, if you will, under the bridge. So you're seeing people, it, it appears like they're walking out of the water, but they're not. They're coming from the, the docking area under the bridge, and they are probably out there for some sort of um, group picnic activity because it's quite a large number. Now we're going back to the hamlet of Lysander, and as we said, we this one would be probably what you'd see first. The communities had their churches and had many of them. And actually, Lysander, go out there today, you still see many, many churches. And this was the Methodist church. The Methodist community in Lysander was extremely active. And they built their first church in 1854. And what we see here is the church after several renovations. And it was part of a really densely occupied village center. And this photo was taken about 1900. Unfortunately, the next photo is going to show you what happened in 1906. It was densely populated, and their next door neighbor was a blacksmith shop. There was a devastating fire, and here you see the members of the congregation inspecting all that was left of their church, which was the foundation and the stonework. But that's part of community story as well. Um, most of the stories in the book are much happier. And now, Sue, we're at the last chapter, After Hours. 
And people didn't sit around the television set or the computer and, and stay home, but they went out and they did a lot of things. And one of the most interesting things was the 1863 wedding of Tom Thumb and Lavinia Warren. I never heard of that before, but she's going to talk about that and show it. And uh, in the picture, you're going to see two women wearing sashes saying, vote for women. Of course, that was 1915, before the women had votes. And then, of course, there's the Beeville Academy baseball team. And uh, we have the Bachelors Club with the Dolls bowling team and other familiar names. Let's talk about that, Sue. After hours, that's the fun part, right? I love it. Well, actually, Norma, uh, the wedding of General Tom Thumb and the lovely Lavinia in 1863 Tom Thumb, as we know, was a small person, and Lavinia was the same size as Tom. And this wedding was promoted by P.T. Barnum. Got it. All right. Okay. And so Tom Thumb and Lavinia traveled all over the United States, and they were, you know, quite an interesting couple. And uh, Barnum made mucho money on, on that. But Considering the sizes of uh, Tom Thumb and his bride, it made a very interesting children's activity that was carried on for generations where kids would reenact the Tom Thumb wedding. It was a great activity. You could have as many children as you had available to fill out the members of the wedding party. They could be guests. They could do all these good things. And this particular photograph was taken in 1915, and the activity was reenacted in our Methodist church down at the point of Charlotte and West Genesee streets. And the sanctuary is still recognizable. Interestingly enough, Though, as you pointed out, on the far, I guess when we're looking at it, it would be the far left side of the photograph, we have two women whom I presume were part of the organizing force for this wedding. And if you look closely, they are wearing shoulder sashes that say, Votes for Women, 1915 Baldwinsville, New York. But of course, that brings us back to something we've talked about during other visits here at the museum, Baldwinsville's women were always um, treated with respect, and they were certainly in the forefront of activities that uh, weren't probably engaged in as radically in public as um, their sisters in other communities. Baldwinsville always seemed to support its women, and here we go. But Tom Thumb Wedding, big deal <laughs> for little people. And the museum collection of, of sports uh, teams is, is so, so, so rich. And certainly sporting activities were a big part, and still are, of after-hours activities. And it was difficult to um, just select a few pictures to put in here, because there are so many. And this is from the 1930s. And this, it was taken at the uh, high school, uh, the old Baldwinsville Academy grounds. You can see the school fence in the background. And every man in here is named from Coach Wes Getman, who can be seen in the lower right-hand corner in the front, to Wynn Baker and other assorted wonderful Baldwinsville names and fa familiar figures, many of whom we've known and whose children are very much a part of today's community. So we had lots of activities. and. When we uh, continued, uh, probably one of the more interesting groups that, and you mentioned it, was the Dolls Bowling League. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. Bowling now is very popular again. Uh, remember, it was big in the uh, late 19th century, very big throughout the war years and into the 60s, and then it seemed to sort of quiet down for a bit, and now it's a, a very popular activity again. The Dolls Bowling Team... And that's exactly what the shirts say, D-O-L-L-S, was part of the Bachelor Club. And the Bachelor Club was an interesting group of quite a sizable number of Baldwinsville men. And we've got that picture coming up on the screen, I guess, right now. And they formed in 1909, and they were unmarried folk. And this photograph was taken in February 1914, and this was the occasion of their last annual banquet they had decided the club would dissolve. So this was their group photo, and on the back, they identify all of their members 
with the following preamble, and I presume it was written in hand on the back of each copy of this photo. And it goes, In years to come, when the hand of time has placed its work upon us, and our grandchildren climb upon our knee, may our hearts grow young again, and memories carry us back to the good old bachelor club days, and return to our minds the names of, and then they're named, John Doran, Blaine Cartwright, Raymond McCarthy, Leon Conklin, Harry Town, Paul Upson, Dr. Stack, Ellery Post, Dr. Sullivan, Lewis Peckham, William Rogers, Charles Ellis, and in the last row, Clarence Smith, Charles Krauss, John Northrup, Charles Steele, George Sawyer, Larry Jacobson, Charlie Kelly, Spike Mercy, Mercer, and Harvey Ward. Well, Sue, thank you so much for this wonderful and such an interesting interview. And um, let's talk about how interesting everything was and how, how greater Baldwinsville was in the early 1800s as compared to uh, Syracuse was just a little town, swampy and everything else. And, uh, and then we hope that you'll tell us where we can buy this great book. Well, thank you, Norma. I think I think the book shows that indeed we were up and coming and moving and locomoting and all of that cool stuff. And uh, you're right, Syracuse was a couple of generations behind us as far as getting going. Uh, the photographs that we've uh, been able to enjoy are just part of, I think we've got about 240 photos in here. And um, they came essentially from the museum's wonderful photograph collection that has come from community. So uh, here's an opportunity to say if you have wonderful photographs or photographs that you just think are interesting or just photographs of old Baldwinsville, please share them with us. Uh, if you're not ready to part with them, allow us to make copies. That would be great. And we can archive your memories and your information. And you'll be part of the big picture of Baldwinsville. And the museum is delighted to be able to say that, of course, the book is available at the museum shop. And uh, proceeds from the sale of the book, of course, benefit the museum. And it's another way to help us uh, afford to keep our archives going so Baldwinsville's story can continue to grow and be protected. Thank you so, so much for spending all this time with us. I'm Norma Goodman. And Joe Lafredo is the videographer. And we hope you have enjoyed this wonderful historical program. Thank you.